Um, well, basically, what I want to say this is so is that okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. But my, my take home message, which I'll begin with, is this that, that the science that underpins all of the analyses of the uh, exposures of the Marshall Islanders and indeed an awful lot of other people after Chernobyl and after uh, uh, the Iraq wars and, uh, um, and, and indeed close to nuclear power stations and so on, all of the science that underpins all of this, that, 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 that permits these uh, circumstances to, to occur, is wrong. It's wrong. And not slightly wrong, but enormously wrong. Wrong by orders of magnitude, by hundreds and hundreds of times. And the evidence for that is now completely clear. It's evidence that comes from mechanistic studies of radiation in cell biology studies. It's, it's, it's from uh, theoretical studies that show all sorts of things, which I should just cover in the short time we have. Um, it's, it's clear from epidemiological studies of people who were exposed in Sweden to Chernobyl radiation, people who were exposed in Europe to Chernobyl radiation, people who were exposed in Iraq to um, uranium from the usage of uranium weapons. And of course, not only in Iraq, but also in the Balkans too. And now there are hundreds, maybe almost a thousand scientific papers published in the, in the theory of the literature which show this to be the case. And nevertheless, despite all of this, the uh, international community has done absolutely nothing to change the, uh, the, the, the laws which relate to these situations. Now, why, 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 the, the laws which relate to these situations have to do with the radiation risk model. That, that is to say, uh, and I better say what that is, that the radiation risk model is a, is a model that, it's a sort of scientific model that was developed originally in the 1950s uh, in parallel with the developing uh, nuclear weapons uh, tests. And it was almost certainly developed exactly for that reason, because in the 1950s many people in the world were becoming very concerned about the contamination of the biosphere, of the environment, by the many new radionuclide substances which had never existed on Earth prior to 1945, and the fissioning of uranium, substances like plutonium-239 and cesium-137 and strontium-90, uh, a whole range of radionuclides which were new elements, elements that never existed on Earth prior to then. And the problem is that these elements are the same elements that living systems employ for all sorts of uh, necessary processes and in fact that living systems evolved with. So this was an entirely new hazard in the 1950s. And because it was becoming clear to those doctors who were studying the, the, the issue that these substances, uh, when, exposed, when people were exposed to them at very, very low levels of exposure, were causing serious uh, genetic and genomic damage, that is to say increases in uh, infant mortality, increases in childhood cancer, increases in adult cancer, uh, general loss of uh, viability of organisms, and of course all the associated environmental problems, so, so uh, species loss, developmental problems in species and so forth. Um, as, as this became, was becoming clear in the 1950s and 1960s, those people who were concerned to continue the nuclear testing and to, to, to make the bombs, and of course they had all their own reasons for this, political reasons, maybe good political reasons, not, not for me to argue. Um, these people moved to cover up any, any research into these effects, and yet a lot of research was still done, particularly in the Soviet Union. And uh, a number of scientific papers were published, particularly, uh, most importantly, on the substance carbon-14, which was produced in enormous quantities in these uh, Marshall Island tests, uh, and to uranium itself, which, is, which has been entirely overlooked in, in nuclear testing. So in a paper that was recently written by the health, in the Health Physics Journal uh, by, um, by a number of uh, United States scientists, um, it was argued that the fallout on the Marshall Islands could not have caused any of the effects that people are arguing that, that they might have been causing. So, so, and this is and this is a, a, a very common, a, a very common occurrence, a very common move that, that 
that the physicists associated with the development of nuclear weapons are now associated with all of the risk agencies like the International Atomic Energy Agency, like the International Commission on Radiological Protection, the International Commission on Radiological Units, the National Council for Radiological Protection, the Health Protection Agency in England. Every country has one of these. The scientists associated with this are essentially physicists, and what they do is they model the uh, outcome of any uh, radiation exposure in terms of a quantity called absorbed dose, um, which is a very simplistic concept. It's the amount of energy per unit mass that, that is transferred by radiation to the body. And so, in essence, they can counteract any argument that there is a real effect from radiation by saying that it's impossible that there can be, because the dose is too low. And this is the essential situation that we're in at the moment, that there are, there are two radiation risk models. There's the one that is actually applied at the moment, and it's applied in court cases, and it will have been applied here in, the, in these nuclear train, claims tribunals in the United States. And I come across it all over the world uh, as I act as expert witnesses in various court cases, um, where you have this dissonance, this mismatch between actual observations on the ground, clear epidemiological studies which show an effect, which show increases in cancer, increases in congenital health, malformation in children, a whole, an enormous range of quite clear and obvious effects associated with prior radiation exposure on the one hand, and on the other hand you have a load of physicists who are saying that, it, it, that none of these things can be real because the radiation risk model does not predict them. And the most powerful and extraordinary situation uh, with regard to this is the discovery or the observation, the reporting of, an, of, of childhood cancer near nuclear installations. Where, wherever anybody has studied nuclear installations, and very recently there was a big study in Germany called the Kick study, and then also this was followed by Fourier in France, who looked at all of the French nuclear power stations. And wherever you look near a nuclear site, you find an increase in childhood leukemia. And yet the physicists of the international risk community continue to persist in saying that these leukemias cannot be caused by the radiation, even though it's known that radiation is the main cause of childhood leukemia. So we're in a kind of bizarre never-never land situation, and we can't seem to make any progress. Now, what I wrote down here to talk about was four things. Failure is the first thing. Second is evidence, third thing is consequences, and the fourth thing, of course, is action. Because I have been to many, many meetings all over the world to talk about this issue. And up until recently, all that happened was that everybody agreed that it was a problem. And, and uh, usually these were anti-nuclear meetings, but not always. And people would throw their hands up in the air and say, isn't it terrible? We can't do anything. We can't do anything. The governments won't listen to us. We can't take it to court. The courts won't listen to us. All of these things, but there is actually something that can be done. So before I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there'll be some time this year, and I've got to go soon to, to talk about Fallujah, uh, and this is next door. So if anybody's interested in one of the most uh, serious and extreme examples of the failure of the radiation risk model, it's with regard to uranium weapons and depleted uranium, and so I'll be talking a little bit about that as well next door. Um, in the next meeting, that, that, that's uh, about half an hour's time. And I will cover more, be covering more or less the, the same ground here. So the failure, essentially, is a failure of an analyzing the situation of radiation and health through the, through the lens, through the distorting mirrors or the distorting prisms of physics. The, the people who develop nuclear weapons and the people who study these, uh, these situations of exposure are principally physicists. And physicists are, 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 are by, 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 by nature, by, by filtration, by personality, they're very powerful thinkers in using mathematical methods. And they tend to reduce everything to very simplistic situations. And in this case, what they have done is they've modeled radiation in people, as if people is a, are, are made of water, they're just a big bag of water, and you're transferring energy to them. And this might well work if you're hanging weights on a piece of wire to make to, to see how it stretches, but it doesn't work with people. It doesn't work with living systems, because living systems have extremely complex responses to radiation or indeed to any other stress. And so, in the last 10 years, it's become quite clear as a result of lots of experiments done in laboratories 
that the basic um, that the basis for the current radiation risk model is entirely wrong. It's entirely wrong. So the biology behind the, the current radiation risk model is wrong. Uh, cancer is not caused in the way that the current radiation risk model thinks it's caused. Um, the epidemiological studies uh, that, that have been used in order to underpin the, the current radiation risk model are wrong because they don't take into consideration uh, uh, other causes of death, what's called confounding causes of death. So obviously, and since cancer is, a, is the main um, outcome that's expected by the, by the current risk model, and that's, the, that, that's what's modeled is cancer, uh, they do not deal with the possibility that lots of people who are exposed to die of other causes before they can possibly ever get cancer. So, they're considered, so, so in terms of these, these retrospective risk, risk studies like Marshall Island studies or Chernobyl studies or studies of people exposed to radium and so forth, all of these are, are, are faulty. The, um, the evidence that this is so includes an enormous number of studies, studies of test fallout, my own, my own involvement in this issue it has to do, is, is related to nuclear test veterans. I'm, I'm an expert witness on a number of big court cases in the United Kingdom relating to the nuclear test veterans, the, the, the soldiers who were out there at Christmas Island and were exposed to radiation. And, and what I discovered and what has won me at least five or six now test veteran cases in courts, because in courts you, you win on the basis of evidence and not on the basis of who's more important as more professorships. Um, what, what we discovered is that the main element that's been uh, omitted from all of these studies is the element uranium. The nuclear bombs that were dropped on the Marshall Islands were made of uranium. And yet all of the studies of the Marshall Island uh, radiation exposures entirely fail to mention uranium. Uranium is not mentioned, it's not measured. It's not measured in the people, it's not measured in the material, it's, it was never measured at the time, and yet the bomb is made of uranium. Uh, one bomb contains about one ton of uranium, and that uranium has exploded, it's turned into microparticles which are then inhaled, get into the lungs, get into the lymphatic system, go into the body and stay there for at least 20 years. We've done a huge, a, a lot of studies of, of uh, nuclear test veterans, no, of uh, Iraqi people of um, veterans of the Iraq War, American veterans of the Iraq War, and a lot of studies with animals have shown that the half-life of uranium particles inside these people is more or less infinite. Once the particle gets inside you, there it is forever. And it irradiates local tissue and it causes genetic damage. Principally, it causes genetic damage. So the children get sick, and then the children's children get sick, and then the children's children's children get sick. Because what is now known is that the effects of these materials is not genetic damage, it's what's called genomic damage. There is a, a, a new discovery in the last 10, 15 years, which uh, shows, quite, and is now completely accepted in the scientific community, that if you get exposed to a material like this that affects your genetic um, uh, in, in, integrity, which affects the DNA, it throws a kind of switch called genomic instability. And what that switch does is it causes the, the, the uh, replication of the genetic material to be faulty. It does this, uh, and the reason it, the reason it does this is not entirely known, but it's considered to be uh, an evolutionary advantage, and it's supposed to have occurred as a result of, of evolution. But what, whether, however it's occurred, it is there, and it's, it's, it's now accepted to be the case. And, and we've studied uh, mice after Chernobyl, and we know that in the mice after Chernobyl, that we, which had this switch thrown, 22 generations of mice are suffering genetic damage. 22 generations. And so uh, when I studied the nuclear, British nuclear test veterans um, in a questionnaire epidemiology study in 2006, I found that there was a nine-fold excess of congenital malformation in the children of the nuclear test veterans, and there was an 8.5-fold increase in congenital malformation in the grandchildren of the nuclear. That, now, if this was a genetic effect, it would dilute it go down one half, one half, one half as you go down the generations. But it's not doing this. What it's doing is it's continuing. And just like the mice in the red forest after Chernobyl, we have the same level of genomic uh, error and gen uh, as shown by chromosome defects, as shown by gen genetic damage in the children in every generation that's been looked at so far. And this is particularly true also in Fallujah, where we have seen uranium used 
and enormous increases in congenital malformation. And uh, uh, just published in a paper that I published with my colleagues in Iraq two weeks ago. Um, so this is a new, a new paper. It shows an 11-fold uh, increase in congenital malformation in the children of Fallujah. These are children who were, whose parents were exposed to uranium. And in this case, we know that's the case because we measured the uranium in the hair of the parents. So it's not like going back to the Marshall Islands and trying to do some sort of historical research, which is why I was asking the lady here, you know, if they could remember back that far. In the case of Fallujah, we didn't have to do that. We can actually look in the hair of these women, and it was only, you know, five years before that they were exposed. And if we get women with long hair, we can actually, because hair grows at a certain rate, and it's kind of like a, it's like an ice core, it's historical. And you can look at the end of the hair, and you can find the uranium, and it's there, so we know that. So that I, I, won't, I won't go on and on about this. I just want to say that, that, that there are huge errors in the current risk model, and that this is the reason why these people from the Marshall Islands have, have accurately identified the fact that they have been seriously damaged by the effects of these bombs. It's an explanation for why the United States continues to argue that they cannot have been damaged, because what they have done is organize some enormous study that says that the doses doses are too low for any damage to occur. So finally, the question is action, because as I said before, um, it's all right, we all get over here, we say these things and nothing happens. So what can we do? Well, actually, there is something that we can do. There is a petition which I have written based on international human rights conventions, but also based on the, uh, the, internet, the, the Euratom, Euratom uh, Treaty Basic Safety Standards Directive, which is, a, which is a member state law in the European Union. And uh, the Greens in the European Parliament, uh, who I advised in 1998, managed to get a clause into this which said that if new and important evidence arises that there are some problems with the Basic Safety Standards Directive, then the entire matter of justification of all practices nuclear has to be redone. Really it has to be redone. This is, this is law. So it's not just a question of writing a petition to the Parliament or a petition to the Commission and saying, you know, we don't like radiation. Chris Busby says it's very dangerous. What you have to say is that there is new and important evidence that this uh, law is wrong. And built into the law is a, is, a, is a clause that says that if there is new and important evidence, everything has to be re-justified. Everything. Every single project, every single process, associated with the exposure of human beings to radiation has to be re-justified. That is to say, they have to come along and have to say, yes, we, 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 are, we, we can contaminate you because you're going to get very lots of free electricity. They have to do that again. And in the past they can do it because they could say the doses are so small that nobody's going to get hurt. But now they can't do that because there are between 50 and 100, um, research, well, maybe 1,000 research papers that show that they're wrong. And once you get into court with this, it's no longer possible for them to wheel out somebody who says, I am the president of the ICRP and I say that this is the case. Because it doesn't work in the court of law. It doesn't matter how important you are. If you're a witness, you give evidence. And that's how we can manage to win this. And, that's it. and so for those of you who want to get involved in this, we have uh, started a new organization in Vilnius, Lithuania, called the International Commission on Nuclear Justice. And it has a website, www.nuclearjustice.org. And you can download the petition from there uh, in French, in English, uh, in Spanish, uh, and soon in German. And all you have to do is to send it around to everybody, and they sign it, and they send it to the European Parliament. The Commission's uh, the, the uh, President of the European Parliament in the address, which is Rubiets in Brussels. And with a bit of luck, so many of those petitions will, will end up there. This has been going for a month now, and thousands of petitions are being sent. It will force them into some sort of action over this, which will open this whole can up, this entire box, black box issue of the risk model. A risk model which has been faulty since 1952, and is uh, the cause of the deaths of more than 60 million people from cancer, and more than 100 million children from the effects of radiation uh, on, on the genetic material. And we know this to be true because studies have been done of sex ratio. That's the number of children born, number of men, boy, boy children born to the number of girl children. 
And in a study by my, my colleague Harlan Scher at the Helmholtz Institute in Germany, uh, he showed that after every single exposure, after every single release of radiation to the environment, after Chernobyl, uh, of people, in people living close to nuclear sites, there is a, a change, a sudden change in the number of boys born to the number of girls. And what that means is that these tiny amounts of radiation expressed as dose, but not expressed as contamination, have caused a significant effect on the genetic nature of the human race. And not, of course, the human race only, but, but, but all the big systems. So, so that's my, that's my um, rallying call, if you like, to those of us who want to stop this. Thank you. How would a petition to the EU create the opportunities that might affect and, uh, and engender an, an ability to restore human rights in the Marshall Islands? Well, absolutely, directly, because what, 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 what it would do is it would take, it would take a brick out from under the entire edifice. See, all of, the, all of these people are connected. The, the Euratom Article 37 group, I think, and the uh, Beatty Safety Standards people, and the International Commission on Radiological Protection, and the International Atomic NEATC, and the ICRU, and the ICRP, they're all basically the same people. It's a group of people that just swap swap personnel through different departments. So like that you'll find the same man in the ICRU, the president of the ICRU, his name is Menzo, is also on the International Commission on Radiological Protection and was previously on the International Atomic Energy Agency. And Abel Gonzalez, who was the head of the agency, then became the head of the United Nations Committee on Scientific Effects on, on Atomic Radiation. And in fact, a lot, of, a lot of these people, if you're interested in this, you go to the website of the European Committee on Radiation Risk. This is the latest risk model, and all of this information I've been telling you, or most of it, is here in this, in this risk model, which we made free. We made it a free download from the website, which is www.euradcon, E-U-R-A-D-C-O-N.org, uh, after the Fukushima accident. I, I've been arguing, of course, that that was going to cause an enormous number of deaths. So, my, my, yeah, so do I answer to your question? Yes. If, if, you, just, if, you, if you pull it apart in one country, and certainly a country, not really a country, but a, an area as large as the European Union, if you destroy this risk model in the European Union, then that, of course, will be a precedent for destroying it in every other country, and particularly the United States, because this is where it came from. This is a United States risk model. Whatever they say about the ICRP, it's no more international than, than, than any of these other organizations. They all track back to, to Washington. So the, the, the National Council for Radiological Protection, set up in 1952, but then made part of the, uh, of the American legal system in 1955. Uh, the ICRU, the International Commission on Radiological Protection and Units, also in Washington, both of them share exactly the same address, which is 3910 Woodmont Avenue, Bethesda, Maryland which is just over the Potomac River from, the, from Langley, Virginia, which you must all know is the headquarters of the CIA. And in fact, the, the, the site in Bethesda, Maryland, shared by the NCRP and the ICRU, also has on it the Environment Office of the CIA. And so we're talking about people who originally were there to, to, to allow the development of nuclear weapons and to knock on the head any possibility that people would start to think that these were actually killing people. And the first victims of this were, of course, the Marshallese. Well, no, of course they weren't. The Japanese were the first victims of this. But the first victims of the cover-up was the Marshall Islands, that's for sure. OK, I think that just about does it. Thank you. Unless there are more questions, I can answer some questions. I've mean, got five minutes, haven't we? Naji wants me to go into it. The, the thought I had was that in, in the Special Rapporteur's report, he includes a recommendation that, a, a number of recommendations, but nationwide in envir uh, environmental assessment, nationwide study, as well as uh, uh, nationwide health assessments. Um, and in terms of uh, earlier concern in other parts of the United Nations on the Marshall Islands experience that um, uh, I believe it was the IAE, the, the, the scientific body that's charged with uh, uh, Radiation research, UNSEERS. Uh, could be United Nations, uh, yeah, UNSEERS. Yeah, sure. And uh, that they, they, they issued a statement saying that if there's any study to be done in the Marshall Islands, it is our body that should do it. 
yes. uh, using our health physics model. Well, this is what you must be that issue. So I guess that was the reason I raised it, is that is that your, your, your explanations points to the, the flaws in that. That's right. It's very important that you don't do that. As soon as the arms gear come in, you have to get out the garlic. <laughs> um, yes, and, and I'm very pleased to see that, because I wrote a report for these on, on behalf of uh, these, these, these wonderful anthropologists here. I, I wrote a report uh, taking exception to the arguments that were made about the last of these exposures. And in there, I made a number of uh, recommendations, and I'm amazed to see, and very happy to see, that most of these recommendations are almost word for word in the special rapporteur's report. And I, I'd just like to finally say that, that in, in section D it says here, um, ensure that impact assessments use reliable baseline studies, blah, 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 and then at the end, and be carried out by competent, independent third parties. And that is the key to this, because if it's not carried out by competent, independent third parties, and by this I mean myself and my mates, or possibly other people, you know, that we, we think are okay, then I can tell you what will happen, you know, at least I don't need to tell you what will happen, I think you know. I think you know what will happen. They will tell you that your doses are too low, and however many heads your children have got, it couldn't have been caused by radiation. That's what they will say. And that's what they say in Iraq, about all of the massive effects that have been found there. They bring in the, 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 the independent competent authority in Iraq was the Royal Society. The Royal Society in London was brought in to cover up the effects in Iraq. And it did that. It said that the doses were too low to cause the effects of a BC. So it, and it did this by applying this risk model that I've been talking about. So thank you very much for listening, and thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to, to, to present this, this issue, um, which, is, which is actually, I think, goes much further than the martial arts.